This is all about someone who pulled a tortoise out of a hat instead of a rabbit, but the tortoise won in the end. When I was young, I think I was kind of old when I was young. When I look back, I felt really aware of time passing. I've realised as I, I've grown older that um, the passing of time is inevitably the thing that actually motivates you to do anything. If you lay in bed one day, it's like time passes, it's like the day's gone, you know, so everything becomes a choice and much more keenly a choice as you grow older. It doesn't seem like 25 years ago since Three Metro Boys. When I was young, I never performed. I never. I, mean, I was never in a school play. I was always like doing wardrobe. I hated the idea of getting on stage until I first sang when I was, I was 17. And I very reluctantly sang a David Bowie cover cover song at our first show, and I suddenly I was bitten by the idea of like singing to people. My dad's a really good singer, and so I thought, well, if he's good, then it's like probably genetic. So I went with it. But um, I've never been a natural performer. arise out of a certain urge to kind of communicate. Um, I was studying French at school, uh, primarily because I, I had an older brother who had read me various extracts from French literature. He would always say, you know, a translated piece is never as good as the original. It sounds terribly pretentious, but at a young age I was really intrigued by Sartre and Camus. I just liked that idea of like alienation, and I felt a, a kind of these were kindred spirits. 
and so I decided I would learn French. A strange kind of opening moment happened that language, it wasn't about English. Language was like this, this thing that everybody had and it was like used in different ways. And primarily at that age, I, I was touched, I think, by the idea that here was someone who wasn't feeling what they thought they were supposed to feel and, and that was me. It made me realize that, you know, other people feel this not feeling right feeling too. And, and all the things I think that thinking teenagers go through, what, it's kind of fundamental to the sentient being that realises it's got a finite span of life on the planet. I have mixed feelings towards the song because it's caused me an awful lot of grief down the years, but it's great fun to play. But at first, like the first couple of years, I really didn't like my voice at all, actually. I, I hate it on the first record that we made. I really, really don't like it. Because I, I tried to turn it into something else. But then by the time we did that second album, I decided I would just sing like I speak. And that's what I've done ever since, really. What I do is fantastically ego-driven. The idea that I can write a song and sing a song and people will be interested is so beyond how I really am as an individual that I struggle to come to terms with it. I always have since I was very young. on stage you have to believe that only half the audience likes you and the other half hate you. It makes you feel a bit kind of like harder. So if someone chucks a bottle it doesn't matter because that's one of the 50% that hates you so it's, they're idiots. You know? If I thought that The Cure was becoming something other than what it was intended to be I would stop. 
I've always got this tiny young voice in my head saying, don't fuck it up. Have you got put, put different pickups on it? Nice.
side of the door Said fill your beautiful faces I saw them all before Now this is not about running out on you Not a case of right or wrong It's only that it's over and over for me It's already I kind of felt like we were starting again in a funny way because I didn't expect to make this record. I thought that we would finish the band um, after the trilogy film that we made in Berlin a couple of years ago. That was supposed to be the end of The Cure. So this is just a bit sort of... Um, it's actually quite strange, all the attention that we're getting again this year. <laughs> song end of the road so it's the cure frontman robert smith joins us now how are you very well thank you we just got we it reminds us of what what we're doing it for really like that you're in a group you're playing music to people that's the whole point you know Nothing else is really is really that important. Um, I dedicate that to you. Woo! Woo! Give you a hug.
I've had some awful kind of moments in the last couple of years of thinking, well, maybe it is time that we stopped. I thought that after the last album, and the reason why the last album was called The Cure, everyone involved knew that was it. But I really went into that project thinking this is the definitive Cure album, it's everything I've, I've worked towards, and after this I go and do something else. But as it turned out, I'd had long talks with Simon and Jason, like we did a thing as a three-piece, and then Paul, who's my brother-in-law, who I see all the time, just mentioned after a glass of beer, like, maybe you'd like to, you know, get me back in, like... And that's how, you know, it happened. It was the first rehearsal we had as a four-piece was just so good. We played for about six hours, and it's like... When that happens, you think, well, maybe it's not time to give up yet. Looking back over these first four albums, um, with the exception of 17 Seconds, which was a four-piece, I, I realised how enjoyable I, I, I found being in a trio was, how simple it was and how easy, and how there's a lot of space in the music as well, from on a creative level. We played with space a lot more in those days. There's something really nice about allowing... Um, an instrument to breathe, which when, when you're playing you know, a five or a six piece, it's very, very hard to find the room for everyone to, to, to do that. So I'm kind of taking a cue from our past into um, what, what comes next with the cure. It doesn't feel like 30 years that the cure... Like it's, it's 30 years this May that the first album came out, but it's exactly the same in a funny way. That, that is, there's four of us, but the mentality is the same. It's like you want to play songs, you want it to like mean something to you, and then you want it to like go beyond that and mean something to other people. So the 30 years goes by in a flash. Having said that, I feel like it's been at least 3,000 years. Our first big gig, the thing I was actually really, really early on, was um, we, we played the Reading Festival in I think uh, 1979, I think, or probably, when the, the very first album came out, we got stuck on the bill at the Reading Festival, quite low down underneath the um, the specials and, and Motorhead were, were headlining and um, and John Peel was comparing it all and John Peel had played us, I think that's maybe he had some reason why we were on the bill because it was a really, it was like a heavy metal festival in those days, <laughs> we were so out, I mean the specials were pretty out of place as well but there was a lot of them and they were really hard. I mean, we were seriously out of place. And Motorhead took us under their wing and, and took us into their caravan. Um, I've still got a Motorhead flag from that Reading Festival. But that walking on stage at a festival and getting bottles of piss chucked at you before you'd even played a note, that it made me feel so punk. It really did. It did something to me. Inside my head there was like a... It's a strange walk. The, 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 the bit that really matters is actually the bit before you walk out of the dressing room into the corridor. The bit that matters is like looking in the mirror a bit. The only time I look in the mirror hot for the whole day is that for about five seconds before we do that walk. And we kind of look at each other. It makes you think about what you're about to do. I think by the time you started walking, you kind of know. Tonight was a bit different because me and Simon were talking about um, the set still. Other times, like we're walking down the corridor arm in arm weeping, you know. It's always different. The walk is always, it's almost painfully light-hearted actually. I'm sure that's true of a lot of bands as well. There's like, there's like people looking at you and you're saying like, alright, yeah, and it's that. And it's almost like you put up a defence, it's like, it's funny, it's funny, it's funny. And then you get to the bottom stairs, you walk up. You walk on stage and pick up your instrument is actually the, the key. It's those few seconds and you like look at the crowd, it's that bit. That's when it gets real.
It's a weird group that I'm in. The legacy is a very odd thing. Through the years, we've been played on radio, we've played stadiums and stuff, but we've never really been perceived as a as a band that you can kind of take home to your mum. We're like, in, you know, we're the weird band that hides behind the tree outside the front door. So it's, I mean, it hasn't changed the world, but there have been moments when we've led the way towards something slightly different and I'm really proud of those moments.
when I was young, I, I felt I could do anything. I really did think. My, my, my mum and dad told me, like, you can do anything. You'll go to the moon, son, you know, like, if you want. I didn't really believe that, but I felt I could do almost anything. As I've grown older, I realise I can't do anything. I need to do the things that I need to do.